Hello everyone, this is Deborah Richardson and today I am putting the AP in Happy where accounts payable teams are empowered to protect the vendor master file from fraud. This podcast will give a voice to accounts payable team members by talking about the growing reality of cyber attacks in their world and which vendor setup and vendor management techniques they can apply to protect the vendor master file from fraud. If you are looking for vendor process training for you or your entire vendor team, head over to my site at DeborahRRichardson.com and click on the Vendor Team Training Solved button to learn more about what is included in the monthly or annual plan and also to download a 2021 training schedule. Get the training that you and your team needs to avoid payment fraud, duplicate vendors, compliance fines, and more. So remember back in March of 2020 when most AP teams packed up abruptly and went to work from home? Well, here are the FBI stats about what effect that chaotic time had on business email compromise and what the FBI says you should do if you are a victim. Keep listening. So welcome to episode 128, FBI stats on business email compromise in 2020 and what they say you should do if your company falls victim. The FBI Internet Crime Complaint Center, IC3, has been tracking reported incidents of cybercrime since 2000, and each year they release a report identifying cybercrime statistics and trends for the previous year. Now, if anyone has attended any of my webinars, I actually do have two slides um, related to fraud, and one of them is the FBI IC3 report from 2019. So I was very excited to be able to update that slide for future webinars, actually doing one next week uh, at the time of the recording of this podcast. And I have updated it to include now the 2020 internet crime report. Now, as you can imagine, there are very interesting results related to business email compromise, given the COVID-19 impact of 2020. But before we get into that, I want to first kind of talk about the FBI Internet Crime Complaint Center, or IC3, in case you haven't heard of it before. So it's formally known as the Internet Fraud Complaint Center. Maybe you've heard of that. They changed their name in uh, 2003. So they've been around since 2000. They changed their name in 2003 from the Internet Fraud Complaint Center to the FBI Internet Crime Complaint Center or IC3. Now, according to their website, their mission is to provide the public with a reliable and convenient reporting mechanism to submit information to the FBI concerning suspected internet facilitated criminal activity and to develop effective alliances with law enforcement and industry partners. Information is analyzed and disseminated for investigative and intelligence purposes to law enforcement and for public awareness. Now, they handle cybercrime, online fraud matters, including uh, intellectual property rights, IPR, um, those matters, uh, computer intrusions or hacking, uh, online extortion, Uh, international money laundering, identity theft, as well as many other internet um, facilitated crimes. And I do see that they do work with 
they either work with international, other international agencies such as Interpol, uh, or they take um, uh, reported incidents of uh, international fraud, online fraud, because uh, if you take a look at the report, we won't go over it here, but if you take a look at the report, you'll see that they have a map of incidents uh, across the world um, that shows uh, the incidents or fraud incidents uh, in other countries. And by the way, the uh, EU um, or United Kingdom, I should say, the United Kingdom is number one. I think they have 216,000 uh, uh, complaints for 2020 that were reported, whereas the other company or uh, other countries were in either the five digits or maybe even the four digits as far as the number of complaints. So the United Kingdom far um, exceeds uh, uh, the inc fraud incidents being reported over other countries other than the U.S. Okay, so now we know who the FBI Internet Crime Complaint Center, IC3, is. Let's now talk about the results for 2020, business email compromise in 2020. And again, as many accounts payable um, or AP teams abruptly packed up the office and headed home to work, the cyber criminals geared up to take advantage of that chaos that some companies experience. According to the report, total complaints for the year was 791,790, and that's up from 467,361 from 2019. So the average of 1,300 per day in 2019 jumped almost 50% to 2,200 per day. And just to frame the context here, this was when everyone was uh, trying to work with IT to get their VPN set up, to get their computers working, to get their second monitor, to get uh, uh, their taking home laptops where before they had desktops. So now, you know, you may have been working with uh, some equipment that you didn't, that you hadn't used before. And so uh, there was a lot of chaos and yes, the uh, complaints for the year show that incidents rose 50%. And also keep in mind, that's just what was reported. How many people did not report? So it, it is important to report um, your incidents. Now, the next thing is that, you know, business email compromise scams, and just to frame it, this is where Froster attempts to trick AP team members into believing they are a CEO or a vendor or some other uh, employee that has authority to add or change vendor bank details so that they can divert payments. There's also other ways um, that they can transfer funds under business email compromise scams, such as with gift cards. And we know that that's been a growing issue in the coming years. Now, what's surprising here is that the number of incidents of business email compromise scams decreased from 23,761 in 2019 to 19,360 in 2020. However, the cumulative amount increased from 1.7 billion in losses in 2019 to 1.8 billion in losses in 2020. That's giving an average loss of 92,000 per incident for the year, which is up from 71,545,000 ,000 per incident um, for the year of 2019. So while the total amount of incidents decreased, the total loss increased. And that's actually in line with some other surveys um, that were done uh, late last year in, in third and fourth quarter, which saw that the business email compromise uh, per incident loss had increased from the quarter before. And 
Also, we've seen articles and posts that talk about the fact that, you know, business email compromise is a more lucrative uh, incident than other types of criminal activity that's included on this report. And hopefully the decrease that was seen in business email compromise scams in 2020 is not the result of a lack of reporting when companies fall victim to business email compromise. So we got to wonder, and I guess we'll never know if there are actually more incidents and a higher amount of loss. And maybe the lack of reporting was just another symptom of the circumstances surrounding COVID-19, the pandemic, and the abrupt change to working from home. Now, another quick fact uh, in the report for business email compromise is that while the total number of uh, BEC uh, incidents have continued to decrease over the past uh, three years, the total loss has increased from $1.2 billion in 2018 to 1.8 billion in 2019. Also for 2020, it is the leading crime victim by loss. Now I do have some visuals uh, where I show um, uh, parts of the report. And if you want to see those as well as get links to the uh, FBI uh, internet crime report for 2020 and some other links that I talked about here and we'll talk about, um, please make sure you click uh, the accompanying blog post that will be in the show notes and you can go there, you can see all the visuals and you can get access to all the links that I talk about today. Okay, so now here is what the FBI says you should do if your company is a victim of business email compromise. So here are four steps that are taken from Uh, the FBI's uh, BEC page, business email compromise page, uh, with more specific information. I've added it where uh, we're applicable. So the first thing is, is that uh, they want you to contact the originating financial institution as soon as fraud is recognized to request a recall or a reversal as well as a hold harmless letter or letter of indemnity. Now, if you don't know what those are, you might want to do a bit of research. I'm going to do the same and maybe I'll have that on a separate podcast, separate blog post to talk about those. Now, the second step is to file a detailed complaint with, uh, with the Internet uh, uh, Crime uh, Complaint Center, uh, IC3, and it's www.ic3.gov. And again, I'll have that link in um, the blog post and the link to the blog post will be in the show notes. Um, it is vital that the complaint contain all required data in provided fields, including the banking information. And I uh, don't have it in the blog and I'll just talk about it here. They do have a, uh, a program. Uh, it's uh, the initials or the acronym is RAT, but really it's talking about um, recovery assets team. So they have an IC3 recovery asset team. So you might want to take a look at that to see if that's something that if your company falls victim that you can take advantage of. It looks like um, they had some success in 2020. Uh, They had an 82% success rate. Um, They recovered $380 million of $462 $462 million in losses. So check that out as well. It's also in the report. It's on page 11. So check out the report. Um, again, the link will be in the blog post and the blog post link will be in the show notes. All right. So step number three is to visit ic3.gov for updated PSAs regarding BEC trends, as well as other fraud schemes targeting specific populations. And so uh, they do have two different alerts. One is for industry alerts. And I would say that's for businesses. I'm actually on that list. And so I get alerts and that's what I um, uh, use to post for my new scam alerts. And if you're not, if you haven't seen those, just go to my site and uh, click on new scam alerts. It's under free resources. 
and you will be able to sign up to get, uh, to get those in your inbox as soon as I publish them. Uh, there's another uh, separate site for to sign up for consumer alerts. And so I would say those are for um, you as a consumer, not necessarily business, but hey, it doesn't hurt to sign up for both of those. There is no, uh, no charge. Uh, the other uh, number four is step number four is to never make any payment changes without verifying the intended recipient. Verify email addresses are accurate when checking mail on a cell phone or other mobile device. And I will say that's a whole nother issue uh, with, uh, and I know a lot of you are using your personal phones or personal devices. Uh, and you know, that can be a security issue uh, as well. So just make sure you're following your company's security policies regarding um, uh, personal and, and company devices. And then also, Again, um, you know, contacting uh, the vendor before you make any payment changes. I've talked about that before, and especially last year when everybody went home and they, some didn't have access to the company phones, how it was hard to do. Well, number one, it was hard in the first place to do the confirmation of bank changes because vendors never answered the phone. And when everybody went home, that just kind of got worse. So I introduced on a couple of webinars and maybe I did blog post, uh, maybe I did uh, some podcasts as well, podcast episodes as well that talked about how to bring in authentication. So the same way that your bank authenticates you when you contact them, when you get the request to change the vendor banking, you need to authenticate the requester. And that's the same way your bank authenticates you when you contact them. They ask you two to three things that you should know. And only after you answer those questions correctly, do they discuss your issue with you. So you need to do the same thing with your vendor. So you can verify that you are communicating with the vendor and not a froster. Further, you can require authenticating data on the documents that you receive to update banking information. So for example, my recommendation is to always require a company branded ACH form. That way you can ask for what you need in order to make the change. And if there is a banking change, you can require on the form that they create or that they give you the existing banking details that's on the vendor record in order to change those banking details. Now, if you'd like more detailed steps and information on that authentication, uh, I will put a link to the on-demand webinar. It's called Protecting Vendor Bank Details When Changes Are Received Via Email beyond the phone call. And I'll put a link to that webinar in uh, the blog post. So you'll link to it from the show notes. And while you're looking at that webinar, check out my other webinars. I do have quite a few. Um, they're all on demand. Um, most of them are on YouTube. And when they're on YouTube, I have them uh, set up or separated uh, within the webinar itself, uh, I have timestamps. So you can jump around to what you need. I have another one uh, called Don't Pay Cyber Criminals, Validate Domestic and International Bank Accounts, Actively Protect Your Payments. That might be another good one that um, uh, you can uh, take a look at to see if you can uh, validate your bank account ownership, which is trending really huge now because of business email compromise. Okay, so I want to wrap this up by telling you where to go if your company falls victim to business email compromise. So if you go to uh, ic3.gov uh, and you can put the HTTPS uh, colon forward slash forward slash uh, www.ic3.gov uh, in your address bar and it will bring you to the Internet Crime Complaint Center and there's a, uh, a menu item called BEC. If you click on that, it'll talk about uh, business email compromise and it will have a little red button there for you to file a BEC complaint. 
Um, you can also go directly to um, BEC or go directly to that page by going to HTTPS uh, colon forward slash forward slash dot um, www.ic3.gov slash home slash BEC or you can just follow the link to the blog in the show notes and I will have a link within the blog post to file a BEC complaint. Um, even if you don't need it now, hopefully you don't go ahead and bookmark uh, that, uh, that page in case you ever do, your company ever does fall victim, you can go ahead and report it. So thanks everyone. I hope you enjoyed the 128th episode of the Putting the AP in Happy podcast, where accounts payable teams are empowered to protect the vendor master file from fraud. Don't forget to check the show notes for the links mentioned in the podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, consider subscribing and writing a review of my podcast on the platform that you use to listen. Stay happy. Stay happy.